Welcome to episode 432 of the Barcelona Podcast, brought to you by the Blue Wire Podcast Network. I'm Dan Hilton, and joining me from La Liga Lowdown is the Barcelona correspondent over there, Roman de Arquer. How's it going, Roman? Good. Uh, very excited to see uh, what this uh, transfer market is awaits for us, we could say, in these last uh, hours, because we'll have to see if Barca finally can bring in a player or not, which is going to be very interesting. So aside from that, uh, happy. At least we're getting the results, which is important. We're at top of the league at the moment, and uh, all that is also good news from a Barca perspective. So yeah, uh, looking forward to chatting about all these different topics. Yeah, so I'm an absolute dummy because for those listening to this, the transfer window is probably closed, but it is noon time on uh, on this Monday or Tuesday. I don't even know what day it is. It's Tuesday on uh, at noon here on the East Coast in New York, which means it's 6 p.m. right now in Europe, in Barcelona time, which means that there's still a few more hours for the transfer window to be open. So again, by the time this is in your ears, most of what the second half of our show is about is unfortunately, not say obsolete, but we're going to hit <laughs> Amrabat, we're going to hit Julian Araujo, because those seem to be the only two real big names that you're hearing in the deadline day. So whether they're arriving or not, we're going to talk about them, get into it, and you have our opinions either way. So I think that's the best way to kind of set that up. But before we get to that, let's do the things that are already set in stone. The 1-0 against Girona was a few days ago. Real Betis is tomorrow. So really, we should be previewing Real Betis more than Girona. <laughs> but I think there's still some stuff from Girona that we need to talk about. First and foremost, regardless of who comes, Araujo, Amrabat, I mean, even if Messi returned to the club, I think that would be the only one to really be a difference <laughs> maker. But I think losing Usman and Dembele for now a few weeks, potentially a month, at least for the first leg of Manchester United was the last time we heard could be longer. So to lose him now for a few weeks time, I mean, I think it's really going to be a make or break moment for Xavi in terms of what he can get out of Rafinha on Sufati and Ferran Torres. And as we kind of said in that Girona match, there seems to be a reliance on Lewandowski to score goals, but the system itself is completely unequivocally built around Uzmai Dembele. I think even more so than Lewandowski. So I think the idea of Demele reliance is really going to be pushed to the test now for the next few weeks. Yeah, there's a lot to, to, to look into in that sense because, of course, uh, missing out Dembele at this stage of the competition is also a big blow, not just for La Liga, but of course uh, for the Europa League you were mentioning against United. That's a, a massive jewel we have there coming up, and he's going to miss both games uh, in that tie. So that's definitely uh, complicates things for Xavi. And then we we'll have to see what happens with all these guys you mentioned, Rafinha, Ansu, Ferran, who aren't really performing up to the expectations we all had uh, towards them. Um, I do think that Rafinha has much more to offer. We've seen how good he can be in the Premier League. Of course, he wasn't playing at Barcelona, a top uh, club of, of one of the uh, top leagues in the world. But still, you know, he proved that he can. he's a fighter and he, can, he has a lot of quality. And we've seen some flashes of that here at Barcelona, but there's no consistency. And that's disappointing because he is getting opportunities. He is getting uh, a lot of uh, minutes. But unfortunately, uh, we saw once again against Girona where he's just missing something you know maybe it's more confidence maybe it's a mental thing I don't know but uh, he has to prove that he can really step up and as you said now it's a big moment for him to, to show us that he is the guy uh, to be played whether it's on the right wing on the left wing wherever wherever um, he, he's made to play that he's got the level uh, he's required from because if not we're probably gonna be talking about him in the future in the next transfer market about possibly leaving the club because of course Barca paid big money and they won't they can't afford to lose uh, or, or any money in that sense you know so they're gonna have to find somebody who can would buy him at a good price and try and kind of cover those those costs uh, but hopefully he can prove his worth in the upcoming weeks and then again Ferran Torres who I thought had some really good moments before the World Cup I thought he was recovering his uh, his football he was very important in some of those wins but then again after the World Cup and during we could say also uh, he maybe lost a bit of that Confidence again, because with Ferran, I'm very confident it has to do with his mentality. That's something that's in here and he has to try and solve. I don't know how, but uh, once he gets past that, I'm sure he could be uh, very important to us. But unfortunately, he's going through this tough moment. And Ansu is another one who I think is having problems physically. He's not the same uh, bef from before his injuries. He's lost a, a bit of that pace he used to have. Also, the confidence for sure is also uh, affecting him. And because playing for Barca in the end, it's, not, it's tough. And even more when you're wearing that number 10 that's been worn by Messi for the last decade or so. So uh, that, that, of course, is an added pressure that Ansu has. And he knows it. And, of course, that's affecting his, his level. But he's still a good player. You know, they're, they're three really important guys for us. And, unfortunately, against Girona and other games, we haven't really seen the best from them. Ferran obviously didn't play, uh, but the other two. And so now we have to see if, if this is really their moment because uh, we need them. Barca needs them. And we want to get far 
in the Europa League. We want to win it if possible. We want to win the league. We want to win the Copa del Rey. So, of course, uh, these guys uh, have to be relevant because we can't always depend on Lewandowski or on uh, Dembélé because, of course, they get injured, they get suspended, etc. And they will be missing uh, further games in the future. Yeah, it's going to be interesting to see because Rafinha, his spot on the right wing has just been under attack because it's Dembélé's spot on the right wing. Dembélé has been better yeah. at that spot. And then Ferran Torres has kind of fit being that inside forward in that 4-3-3. But now we've seen, again, a lot of change basically almost in the three matches because of the, the Spanish Super Cup and the Copa del Rey and all these different competitions in the Liga with Ferran Torres and Robert Lewandowski being suspended. Things have almost changed now that Xavi's Gala 11, the 11 he trusts more than any, have Gabi as that inside forward there in what is in build-up a 3-2-5. You know, it's still a 4-3-3, yes, but Gabi is not even a left winger the way that he was thrown out there by Xavi and thrown out there by Kuman, especially last season. He's playing as this inside forward with the left back being the, the overlapping left back and, you know, being Balde or, or Alba. You know, which which again brings up big questions about the squad and depth and and what they're able to. How many different variations of that without Dembele can can Xavi throw out there? Because Rafinha does kind of change everything because he's this inverted right winger. He does bring a lot more pressure inside. He's not to the touchline and he doesn't add the same width to the horizontal plane that Dembele does. That said, Rafinha I, again I expect him to be on the right. He still whether he's on the left or the right has contributed a higher assist rate than Dembélé even this season. But the eye test tells us Dembélé breaks open a lot more games in a lot more time than Rafinha does. Because Dembélé also, you know, as much as I say, you feel like in the first two touches, Dembélé either has it or doesn't in a match. But I, I think for Dembélé, he generally does have at least two or three moments in every match where it's, it's, it's some kind of chaos. It either might be three minutes of chaos, but it, or it might be 85 minutes of chaos. Because, I mean, the last two weeks, Dembélé was really, really good. Rafinha, though, it seems like the matches that he doesn't contribute much to, you're not getting any mm -hmm. chaos. You're not getting any moments of, of something special. You're just saying, oh, this is one of those where we don't have Rafinha, unfortunately, today. But again, his assist rate is higher. It's the same thing with Ferran Torres last, last year. The eye test isn't equal to what their goal-scoring contributions are, right? It's like True. we see the misses, we see the issues, we see what they, they aren't doing and providing. And we're wondering why Barcelona aren't winning 4 nothing, and they're just winning one nothing. Well, Rafinha is good enough to win one nothing or 2 nothing, but he's not helping the team win 4 nothing. Which, again, the other problem that that brings up, and I think before we get to the transfer stuff, the thing we should already talk about is kind of what has already been put pen to paper, and that is Marcus Alonso's renewal. Which, the only thing, Ramon, that I can think of here, this is, this is it, is that because if you want him as a backup left back, we saw the limitations of what that does. In Xavi's system, you need an overlapping left back especially if you have Kunde, and we'll get to the other transfer targets for the right back spot. But it seems like the right back is the inverse of Xavi ball back in the day when he played, where Abidal was on the left, more stay at home. Danny Alves would get forward. Um, that's the last I'll speak of that name for a while. And the right back spot now is the stay at home spot and the left back spot. So when they go forward, you create the numerical advantages on the left and let that right winger kind of go to work in, in isolation. And Marcus Alonso, you saw the minute Dembele got injured and came off the field, how limited it becomes because he can't get forward at all. Marcus Alonso, he's not a, 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 li a wide left winger. He does not help with the numerical overloads. He's not really a big crosser. And the only thing I could see is why the club is trying to renew him is that a, they trust him over Eric Garcia as a long-term backup option as in the fourth center back, if you will. Uh, and they, as maybe they don't trust Chadi Riyad either to in the next two or three years, come into that role. He's 19, he'll be 20 or 20 this season. So, you're talking about the next two years. So you're talking until he's 22. Fine. Uh, and then Alba, I think they really do. We'll talk about the wages later too. I think they think that Alba, they're going to find a way to get his wages off the books because they have to. It's De Young, it's Alba, knowing Busquets the free agent. So it's De Young and Alba. Those are the big yeah. two that are really putting yeah. Barcelona disadvantage right now financially. So I think they're really kind of saying, hey, we're going to find a way to get Alba out. And Alonso is basically our insurance policy on this renewal. So that's, that's the only reason I could think to renew Marcus Alonso. He's been fine. He's been absolutely fine as a fourth center back. Um, but again, in a, in a club that's so cap stra uh, cash strapped, you have to think that, is that a position that they truly needed to find a renewal for or re-sign a player for? You think that they could find somebody else. But again, my concern is against Girona. You saw you're renewing a player that has severe limitations uh, in the system that Xavi is playing. And that is my concern. Yeah, I, I completely agree with you. I mean, 
I have to, I have to think that its main reason is, is to, in terms of salary. Probably there are very few uh, left backs that having Marco Alonso's level, we could say, or experience uh, that will actually um, be willing to to have such a low salary. That's my only proper explanation. And the fact that as a centre back, as you said, he's done pretty well. Uh, Eddie Garcia has gone from more to less, as we say in Spanish, the de, de más a menos, and we've really maybe lost a bit uh, of, of what he could do. We expected Eddie Garcia to, to grow, to be better and better, to have more opportunities with Xavi, a guy who can uh, bring the ball out from the back, who has quality with the ball at his feet. We thought he would be more relevant, but in the end, he's kind of died away in, in, in that sense. And uh, Marcos Alonso has been uh, more relevant for Xavi in that position. So I do think he's definitely uh, as an option, as an extra option as the centre-back positions, because it's true, we also have also injuries. Kunde and Araujo are quite injury prone, we could say. So now and then you won't be missing them. Christiansen pretty much the same. So we don't have the most reliable and, and, and solid center backs that are going to be there for uh, all the games of the season. We know that they're going to be rotations always. Kunde also having to play a lot on the right. Araujo the same when he's playing, for example, against Real Madrid. He prefers to match up uh, Vinicius with Araujo. So um, I guess Xavi likes to have options and Xavi must like him in the end. You know, he must be a profile of, of a left back he, he sort of likes, even though it's true, as you said, that he doesn't have maybe that capacity to overlap. Maybe at Chelsea he did have a bit more, but of course, age is a factor. And also when you come into a new club, I guess it's not as easy to, to let yourself go in that sense. And he has to be more cautious in defense uh, than going forward. So, I mean, it has to be among these reasons because I don't really see much more. Also, it's true that it's just one more year. I guess that's an easy contract, you know, to to kind of get rid of also in the future is not renewing for three or four years, which of course would be a big problem. So I guess it kind of uh, works out for Barca. And as I said, Barca are really going through this economical problem yeah. at the moment. So they can't really afford to, to, to delve into too many, too many fullbacks. You know, there aren't many options because we're limited in terms of how much we can spend on transfers, on wages, etc. And also a lot of names have been coming up for Xavi for fullbacks, names like Pavard, for example, that People also seem to be a bit surprised with Orbellerin when he when he came in. You know, it's in fullbacks that maybe uh, people aren't happy as, as Barca fans to have them because they don't consider they will really adapt to the system. But that apparently Xavi likes them, so it's also interesting to understand that maybe Xavi has a different way of seeing things than that we do from from outside. You know, so it's also ha sometimes hard to to understand that when you're not inside and you're not seeing what what Ch or, or knowing what Xavi's thinking. But anyway, uh, one more year, I guess. Uh, there could be worse things <laughs> in the end. So we'll just have to deal with that one more year, which I think isn't too bad in the end. Well, yeah, it's always that weird thing where it's like, what is the club able to do? Who can they truly actually bring in to the club? And they, the media might say Xavi likes yeah. that player. And that's what's so perplexing about Xavi. It seems like so often I, I like his ideas, his tactics, the things he's trying to do with his system. And I know that like, it's, it's so interesting because... You can call him dogmatic in a way that I think he's dogmatic in the profiles that he wants in certain spots in his system. And I think that mm. system really does support Barcelona. It, it really supports what they're trying to do. And a majority of their personnel excels in the way that Xavi's building his team. But in the same regard, like all the, yeah, at times the media is like, oh, Xavi likes this player. I go, why? Why, why is that the player that, <laughs> exactly. that Xavi's picking? But I, I think it also has to do with limitations <laughs> as well. Um, so speaking of a player that Xavi should like, I think this is our one positive thing. And then we're going to skip over to the transfer stuff is that Pedri and his 100th Barca appearance has now scored 15 goals in 100 appearances, which, believe it or not, is not too shabby. Again, if most 20-year-old midfielders score 15 goals in 100 appearances, they're like, all right, that's pretty fair. And, you know, I put myself under some attack on TikTok, which, again, I, am, I don't know. These kids are bullying people. I don't know, Ramon. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not a fan <laughs> of this. But anyway, on TikTok, I put myself on blast a little bit by um, putting in the five headlines. And then, you know, it was put mm -hmm. over there that, uh, Fetty Valverde has yep. a, a, a similar number or less. Four, 14 in, goals in 175 games. 176. Yeah, that's what it is. Oh, yeah. 76. Right, right. So 14, 176. And, sh and then Pedri has, yeah, 15 and 100. So, yeah. yeah so looking at those numbers, it's like, <laughs> I mean, listen, I, I like Fetty Valverde as a player. I've, I, there yeah, are yeah, yeah. you go back to from my five headlines, again, former El Clasicos, where I'm like, that was the, the guy. Like, he was, Fetty Valverde outplayed the young in three straight El Clasicos. And Barcelona was put to the sword. So, I mean, even when I watch him, you know, maybe not this season as much, but last season, he was just fantastic. And, you know, I, really, it is not even just the Real Madrid thing. It's even La Liga PR and me watching the game saying, man, he's so much more of a goal scoring threat than Pedri. But again, the numbers do not equal what's actually happening. Um, and for Pedri, even recent history, that's now five in La Liga, two more than last season and six on the season, three of which have come in the last five games. Uh, and what I had already done on the five headlines, I'll rehash a little bit here. 
that I, you know, I know we get the, we, the Inesic comparisons always come up. Um, and for what I do like about the things that, that Pedri seems to do is his goals come in moments when it seems like the team needs a goal. And that's what I'm loving about that. His, his we'll say goal scoring profile so far in mm-hmm. a way that Iniesta, I want to remind you, played hundreds of games, hundreds <laughs> of games and had a lot of moments, massive games because of Barcelona success, because of Spain success. You know, Pedri has yet to be the World Cup final. He may never get to a World Cup final to have that opportunity to score that kind of goal. We look at sure. the Champions League and Iniesta, the Chelsea goal. Like he had the ability to score these massive, gigantic goals. But there's a lot of times that Iniesta also wasn't even shooting and <laughs> didn't score these goals. And so <laughs> to compare those two as goal scorers is interesting because Iniesta has a reputation because of the, the stage at which he scored them. But again, numerically, it's like Pedri might have the ability to help out a little bit more in that category. And as I said at the start of the year, my big thing about Pedri was is he going to become more of a goal scoring threat? And it seems like in this system, in the and I wonder why three of which have come in the last five games. I think it has to do with the system change as well. Both Gabi and Pedri, when playing in front of that box midfield, I know it's not as simple as that, but when you play that box midfield with Busquets and De Jong behind, the whole idea was that that wasn't going to work. But if mm. if Gabi, if, 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 if Xavi can get this to work with Gabi and Pedri up there as not even high interiors, like he kind of said he would do in this 3-4-3 three, three formation, but it really is now a 3-2-5 formation in buildup. And that's pushing Gabi and, and Pedri quite a bit ways forward, where Pedri is not, doesn't have to control as much. And I think we do see his ball retention. We do see his ability to get his way out of pressure. And it felt like last season, he was the best, we'll say, controller kind of profile, if you will, with the club. And in truth, that's where you have to fit De Young into the system. And then you have um, Busquets, who is who's the pivot, who is kind of controlling the pace of the game. And then Gabi is, as I mentioned, that inserted inside forward. And then you have Pedri kind of in this free role, this free role to facilitate the left-sided overload numerically to the right side and that isolated winger. And Pedri's job is now to connect those two and also get forward. And I think that it's not even freedom, but that that role of Pedri to kind of make it his make it his own in how he improves is is making me optimistic for what we could see Pedri do throughout the remainder of this season. Yeah, I mean, it's undoubted that Pedri has uh, talent that a few players have. You know, how quickly he's gone from playing uh, second division, uh, Las Palmas, etc., to suddenly becoming a Barca player. And he already has 100 games uh, for Barcelona. I mean, that's astounding. I mean, I, I didn't believe when I read it. I was like, oh, he's already been this long. But yeah, of course he's been that long. You know, he's been so important to us already, despite, of course, Barca being where they are, trying to recover from uh, being down, not down bottom, but of course being in a low point. And uh, as you said, you know, Pedri really uh, allows Xavi's system to, to work as, as he would like, because without a player like, like um, Pe- Pedri, sorry, that can actually uh, not just move the ball, but control uh, the tempo he's capable of, of, of um, providing to his teammates, but also ju- also finding those spaces in between to, to going forward. And that's why he scores the goals. You know, he likes to be close to the box. You were comparing him to Iniesta, but Iniesta was quite different. He didn't uh, tend to go too much um, in, t- in terms of wanting to shoot. You know, he was more of a player that liked it to facilitate his teammates, wanted to assist, had the quality, but he never really dared as much as Pedri dares going forward and, and scoring goals. So I think that's a, definitely a plus that Barca always wanted in a midfielder like Iniesta, I think. That's one thing that everyone used to kind of like maybe criticize, we could say, uh, regarding Iniesta, was that he lacked goals, the capacity to score more, even though he scored those incredible goals, of course. We were so thankful uh, for those moments, not just for Spain, but for Barca, of course, etc. Uh, but uh, Pedri seems like he could be um, way more relevant in that aspect, and he's a, he's a player for the future, well, for the present and for the future. And having Gavi by, the, by his side, who can also cover... His back at some time because, of course, Gabi also is showing he can go forward. He's also getting some very nice goals. He's also going into the box, being brave. Um, and that helps if you have a guy maybe uh, like Frankie de Jong, who's capable of uh, controlling also from behind when Busquets isn't available. Because I, I do remember that Frankie was going quite more forward, or at least that, that was my perception when he was with Kuman. He, there were moments where he would be uh, the guy appearing behind, you know, the line of attack and he would be getting his opportunities. Now I feel like he's not doing that so much but of course he's also got the presence as you said of from Pedri and Gabi ahead who are also uh, maybe limiting his options going forward but I mean to have those players for Barca I think is just magnificent you know it's at least something that you know that you can build on you can improve you can develop and it'll give you many years of, of great and gorgeous football we could say so hopefully Pedri is still going to evolve I think I think he will 
it's funny to read or or see some people saying that Pedri is overrated, that he doesn't deserve these uh, uh, compliments he gets, that you know the press and the Barca fans have hyped him so much. Trust me, it's not the case. We've been watching every single game uh, with Pedri on the field, and we can perceive and see how good he is. You know, he's an exceptional talent, and he's just. Uh, he's he's oh, well, he's 19 now, I think 18, 19. He's just a kid, you know. It's so much to, more to to go through and so much more to develop. But so many players uh, that play these positions tend to show their their best selves when they reach 27, 28, even 29. And Pedri's so far from there, and he's already class. So uh, very excited to see what's going to keep up coming, keep on coming from his boots because he's just a world class player for me. Yeah, I'll definitely say the last month has been, I think the the best run of form, in my opinion, that we have seen from Gabi and Pedri together, where, as I've said many times, mm-hmm. like there were, there were so many times where Gabi, where I'm like, okay, Gabi was the guy today. And then Pedri kind of took a, a back seat or something. Mm-hmm. But I think the last month, both of them have been consistently together, yeah. making a lot of sense. And I think there's a compliment to, 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 to Xavi in there that he's made it all work. Now, as far as the transfer stuff, so let's, let's I think, put Girona to bed. That's kind of how that happened. <laughs> it wasn't great to me. Unfortunately, it was the most frustrating, I think, of the recent 1-0s. Atletico Madrid, you kind of suffered, had to play Atletico Madrid's way on the road. Then Adafe, Adafe was yeah. kind of sitting parked everybody in the in the goal you just got to get through and they did but Girona was like that game felt like it could have been open and then it wasn't and it, it, that, that, that one was a bit frustrating uh all yeah. that said in Girona I think our our way to tra- to move to the transfer window is the is by talking a little bit about Arna Martinez and I want to do this quickly because it seems like all indications are that he is not even on the radar anymore the Xavi has picked one fourth and Benjamin Pavard over him and I think that's what set a lot of people off now, what I will say is he's owned by Citigroup. And even though it looks like, oh, he's 10, 15 million euro release clause, looks like he would, he'd be possible. He's from La Masi in the past. He was cut when he was 14. He is Catalan, would love to return, all those things. And for the club, not to even, for Atletico Madrid to try to jump in over the summertime, apparently he's already agreed. That's really mm-hmm. frustrating to see that that would have happened, that Barca seemingly would have failed something. But I think for me, one, that makes me a bit more concerned about what Barcelona even is aware that they had to spend in the summertime. That's a concern. I think now players are starting to look and I, apparently Benjamin Pavard is not even a free agent, but he'd be coming for 10 to 15 million euros. And what it sounds like to me, if Pavard is 20 million or 15 or whatever, it sounds like he would buy out his own contract to Bayern Munich and technically come on a free. That's what that sounds like to me with the one year left on the contract. Um, and then also hearing that one fourth. And I think fourth is kind of the, the merging of two because we've seen how good fourth can be. I think he makes a lot more sense than Pavard. He contributes a lot more even offensively. Pavard is a, a net zero offensively. Um, but I think for me, I, I just want to get it on the record here that I have to find a way to, to kind of be over Arnaud Martinez if he's going to Atletico Madrid and kind of say, okay, whatever. But I mean, I was really impressed with him against Barcelona. I've been impressed with him all season long. I've seen him four or five times. Uh, and I think he's just a really good young player. He's still 19 years old. And I think he's a big miss. I think he's one of those where I mentioned over the summertime, Chuamani for Real Madrid. Like, I think Arna Martinez, I put him in the same category. Like, he's, for now, two years now, been on a short list of players. I say, if Barcelona missed out on that guy, who seems like he would be possible if they had money, or he would be a guarantee if they had money, um, I think that's going to be a big miss. But looking at the mm-hmm. other right back stuff, there was Wesley, but, but who plays for the Flamengo U20 team. And apparently they were not happy with Barca's number evaluation. That sounds to me like they're inflating a young player uh, as far as his numbers. I mean, he only has two first team appearances for Flamengo at all. Um, but yeah, it sounds like Pavard, who's in the second percentile, by the way, in uh, in offensive contributions per goals, second, not 20th percentile. I'm not, I'm not, this is not 2-0. This is 0.02 percentile. Uh, he's second percentile in dribbles completed against fullbacks. I, I mean, yeah. I guess all the throwbacks like that's awful. Like, and so that's just concerning because I know that Xavi wants to stay at home right back. We've been talking about that. That's why he fits the profile. And the fact that he wants to play center back instead of right back. He played 14 times of right back this season. That's nine center back times. Um, but I mean, that's concerning too. Like, just like, so you basically have Kunde and, and you have Pavard. Two guys are like, I'd, I'd like to be a center back. And then right footed Ronald Araujo is like, well, I'm here. This is my spot. <laughs> and it, I mean, it seems like you're just creating and continuing a problem where fourth is he profiles and looks like a center back, but he's a right back and he plays right back for Villarreal and he's comfortable at right back is where he is. Um, and then you're putting a lot of the rest of your faith because now you're shipping Bayerine off to sporting CP. 
because Pedro Porto, who another player that everybody wants, but he's going to be like 40, <laughs> 50 million euros. That was a name I never mentioned because I knew he was going to be too expensive. So he's yeah. off to Tottenham. And then again, you missed out on Ana Martinez, who seems like he's already agreed to turn to Atletico Madrid. And now you're talking about the next category, category down, which is Julian Araujo, which again, at time of recording, still questions about that. MLS deals are always tough because yes, they're owned by those teams. You agree the fee with the team, but then it also has to be approved by the MLS um, because all teams are under the umbrella of the MLS financially. So, you know, that it always makes transfers to the MLS clubs difficult. Uh, but that said, yeah. So I gave you a lot of names to mention. Pavard, Poit <laughs> in the summertime, potentially. I already told you which one I'd pick of those two. Arna Martinez would be top of my list, but looks like he's not an option. And then you're talking about Wesley from Flamengo, which I know pretty much none of us have ever seen. And then you're talking about Julian Araujo from LA Galaxy. And of course, I'm going to give this to you, but I know you're handing me back to the baton to talk about Araujo later for, for the Galaxy. I have <laughs> yeah, definitely. You'll, you'll tell us more about him. Uh, but for example, when they mentioned the Brazilian guy, Wesley, I mean, I just don't want to look at that option because we've seen how things have gone when Barca has gone picking in Brazil, these unknown players who nobody's heard about before. Uh, and then it's just a disaster. So hopefully... I mean, they won't take any chances unless, I'll say, unless they're extremely convinced, but I'm sure they were probably extremely convinced in other past times and it's been a disaster. So honestly, I hope that option isn't really a realistic one. And then the fact that Arnaud well, Martinez... You know, I, I, well, I want to say, though, now everyone's, of course, going to be Googling Douglas Santos because that's what happens every time that we all that we always have. There you go. Yeah, was it... I mean, I'm, was it? No, it's not Douglas Santos. Who is it? It was du- yeah, just Douglas. Yeah, that's what it was. Douglas, Douglas, Douglas. Yeah, yeah. he was he was w- one of the many Brazilian uh, failed. We had Luis Enrique. Enrique was it? The one was Kerrison. Uh, there's been uh, the the Mateus Fernandes. Yeah, I mean, he even took the club to court. Yeah, of course, sure. Neymar was the only miracle, and look what happened to the president uh, who was involved, Santo Rosé, who ended up in, in jail. So just imagine. Sure. So it's better to stay away from Brazil unless we're we're actually signing a top quality player that's uh, proven to be a good player there. So. That aside, then there's, of course, the Arnaud Martinez option you mentioned, which uh, it's not just the fact that we're not going for him that disappoints me, but also the fact that he's going to Atletico de Madrid. After all they've done to us, you know, letting another player go to them with the Griezmann situation in the past with all the strikers, with the Villas, with uh, et cetera, et cetera, all the players, it's always been something favorable to them and kind of affected us in a way. And, and we are just seem, seem to to be so friendly with them, always wanted to, wanting to negotiate with them, always wanting to give them options. And I do understand that at some point, of course, in a way, Barca feel benefited by negotiating with Atletico de Madrid because, you know, they're, they're always helping them in a way. But uh, it never works out well. And seeing a player like Arnau going to them again and missing out because he's definitely a very promising talent. We've, we're seeing it this season at Girona. At Girona, who's uh, doing really well, especially a very good offensive team, even though the last few games against Barca and the one before, I did see at Girona, which was maybe a bit more against Villarreal, a bit more um, close down to the back. I guess it also makes sense when you're playing stronger sides. You don't want to uh, take too many risks. But uh, I'd seen a Girona most of the season where they just go all in, you know. It doesn't matter if they're going to concede one or two. They're going to try and score three and four. And that's something I like. And, of course, that that's also a fundamental. Uh, it works out if you have the proper players. And Arnaud Martinez uh, down that wing has been really fantastic uh, going forward. And I think that's something Barca really need, not just defend, but also attack. Because if you can't, can't attack... Uh, then you're really limited. We saw, like, for example, Nelson Semedo back in the days who looked very promising, but attacking, he was just not the guy we needed, you know, and obviously defending, he wasn't great either, but uh, it's not easy. It's not easy to get it right with the right back. Uh, Begirin, also a player, you know, who was playing uh, the Barca youth team, who played for Arsenal, who in a way I don't think it's the most different side from Barca. Obviously, there's there's differences, but I mean, in a, in a sense, I thought that maybe at some point he could be interesting here. Barca did want him years ago, but then, of course, things have changed a lot since then, and Bellerin is obviously not the player he used to be, and he did, ha- hasn't really worked out well here either. So, I mean, it's, it's really complicated, and the, the name which I'm more attracted to is not Pavard in my case. I don't think he's a bad player, but I don't think he's really going to solve our problem down the right. I think we're going to have the same issues, same complaints, uh, same problems. We'll have to end up... Uh, selling him or he'll either be another center back uh, option like uh, Marcos Alonso and I think that's not what we need you know so maybe Juan Foyth for me would be um, the closest player I'd like to to, to to for Barca to sign if we can't get Arnau or anybody better because I mean Foyth defensively for me he's a very solid guy and I think that's something that Barca has been missing in these past years with with having someone who can actually defend uh, because, for example, Sergio Roberto has been playing a lot there. We know that he can help forward and, and generate uh, from the middle going up. But uh, at the back, he was also very vulnerable. But fourth, as you said, he's not just a guy who can defend, but he can also 
uh, providing attack. His position, he's been playing, he used to play as a, as a uh, defending midfielder before. So, I mean, of course, it's not an attacker, but he knows what it is a bit like going a bit forward and, and moving. And he's a brave player because in the end, he's played so many positions. He's also played a center back and he's always adapted really well. You can tell he's really uh, always fighting for the cause. And I think he could be an interesting signing if we get a decent price because Villarreal aren't known for selling players cheaply, especially to uh, strong sides in La Liga. They're always going to want to get a, a big chunk of money out of them. That's why probably they couldn't really reach an agreement uh, previously when they tried to, to get him uh, to, to come to Barcelona. So, I mean, a lot of names, none of them are, are amazing. I guess Arnau is probably the one which we'd like most because, of course, of his past from at Barcelona and, and the quality he has and, and the capacity and room for development but I guess maybe Xavi wants someone who's already more consolidated at the top level and it's true that Darnell maybe doesn't have that experience that maybe Pavard or Foyth uh, would have and regarding the the other option I honestly I can't say much I haven't seen him play but I would be pretty surprised because in the end the MLS is in La Liga I mean some players come like Tati Castellanos and he's been fantastic so I mean uh, there's definitely a lot of really good players there in the MLS there's no doubt about that but I just have my doubts because uh, the right back position at Barca is very demanding. And uh, look what happened to Dest more recently. You know, everyone's talking wonders about him on social media. Like, ah, yes, yeah, sign him from Ajax. He's incredible. He's going to kill it. He had a lot of uh, technica technical capabilities. He liked it to go forward. He, he seemed like the, the ideal player. But then they come to Barca and it's a different atmosphere, a different uh, ecosystem. And, and things change a lot. So it's not yeah. easy. So tell us a bit more about him. Well, I was going to say Dest probably would have been if he had been signed for the Barca B team and kind of been on the outskirts, the fringes of the first team, I think he probably would have done a lot better. But of course, yeah, sure. he was signed to be Barcelona starter when he was a backup at Ajax, and it wasn't going to work out. And yeah, I think defensively, he has kind of been stunted, that being Dest. Uh, but at the time, I was one of those who was hiring him because I thought, you know, mm -hmm. technically, it's very difficult to find right backs that are just that technical as, yeah. as Dest is. Uh, and Araujo, you know, again, I have, as people know, I have an affiliation with MLS, and I've seen him, I mean, at he's played over a hundred matches for their first team. And I've probably seen at least 30 of them or 40 of them. Have I been, and as far as the MLS goes, I mean, for me, as someone who supports, you know, American soccer here, I tend to watch the youngest talents in the league. So Castellanos, I was high on because he was one of the younger talents in MLS. And I do want to say like MLS two is changing a bit where Araujo for me has been one of the top, like 20 talents in the league of the last three seasons. And we're seeing the last two or three years now, and you're seeing with the numbers coming out of MLS that they're as a league being a lot more willing to sell. And you're seeing a lot more South American teenagers or early 20 somethings make the jump to MLS before they move to Europe to kind of mm -hmm. soft prepare them for that jump. And then they go for now a little bit of bigger numbers. So the idea that it's like still a retirement league, like the league that it was with Beckham and Henri and even David Villa uh, mm -hmm. seven, eight years ago is is not the same because another mm -hmm. reminder that mls has been around since 1996 league has been around since 1929 right so these leagues like even the premier league in this modern form look at what they've done in since basically since 92 30 years of creating the broadcasting you know brand this gigantic giant that they become and these kind of things take time um so for mls like just change your perception a little bit now arajo I'm glad he would potentially be signing for the B team. <laughs> and when I say Wesley and Araujo, I'm saying that the reason why is Amarbot, we'll get into him in, in a second, but Araujo being registered with the B team is Barcelona's only option. They don't really have the money to spend to facilitate somebody's contract into the, the first team. And even this, they want this to be a loan with a 6 million euro buy option at the, the latest. So it could go up, it could go down, or he might mm -hmm. not come at all. But the reason why that's that number is because they kind of want to guarantee that they're getting the little something out of this play that being the, one of the galaxy's bigger prospects. Uh, and I think kool -Aid's, my hot take here, Roman, is that if he plays 30 appearances for the first team at some point in his career, I think kool is going to be disappointed with him because defensively he's very sound, but he's mm -hmm. also defensively not perfect. Like he does tend to come forward a little bit, but when he does come forward, his crossing is good. But he's he's going to struggle if Xavi asks him to invert. He doesn't invert well. His technical skill, I know it. Uh, he's born in the U.S. and I know he's a Mexican international. But his technical ability isn't what you'd expect when you see him run with the ball. His dribbling is okay. It's not amazing. It's okay. Mm -hmm. But I'd say he's a very well-rounded, sturdy fullback. And he's young. He's 21. But I also don't know what his ceiling is. So I think he is very much of. What Barcelona is spending six million on is exactly what they know they're getting with him. I mm -hmm. think he's very much what he already is, which again is not a technical wizard. It is uh, a, 
I mean, he's, he's a good athlete as well. And I think that's helpful. So I think if there's this idea that he can improve on a few things in between the ears, like if that, if he's up to that challenge, yeah. then I think he'd have a great deal of success for Barcelona. But I think the way he's constituted at the moment, if he can't add those things to his game, he is no no greater than a backup and would be sold on in, in a year or two's time. Um, mm-hmm. So I think he's I have six million, not really a bit a, much of a risk, and he I think he still has some potential to grow. And my only really concern with him is that positionally, the LA Galaxy, not to drag them too much, but th- since there's Laton days two or three years ago, they have not had a lot of like defensive structure. They just they have a lot of changing faces, and so they have played with five at the back. They have played in a three five two. They have played mm-hmm. with him kind of having different roles. And I think he is one of the compliment to him is that even as a young player, he is one of the ones that have adapted well to all those changes with the galaxy through the seasons. So whether he had to be a a right wing back or a right back or a right Mm -hmm. center back or right midfielder, he's adapted well, I think to all those different changes, depending on where he was on that side of the field. So again, it's not something that is going to light the, light the the house on fire. I don't think he is Barcelona starting right back in the future, but I think he is potentially a backup. He has some potential and Mm -hmm. it's a player that I, I think, I, I'd be excited to see that jump from him, who actually, by the way, little fun fact, he was part of the Barca La Masia Academy in the US. So he was okay. one of those players. So he actually has been kind of on their radar and they've been tracking yeah. for a number of years now. So that's, that's the skivvy on him. So let's move to the other guy. It seems like at time of recording, and I keep refreshing Twitter like crazy, so I'm doing my best here. Yeah, I saw it. <laughs> right. It seems like um, Sofian Amrabat, 26 year old defensive midfielder who. I, I call you out if you say, oh, I watched him at Fiorentina this season. We've, I've got a few credit to those in the Facebook group or Twitter that have called out that he's been worse for Fiorentina than he was for Morocco, which is impossible. Like He was amazing for Morocco, the defensive midfield of the tournament, but he's been hot and cold for Fiorentina this season who are kind of struggling in the middle of the pack in Serie A. And you know, he seems like that Fiorentina wants a loan with a 30 million buy option, which is, I think, too much for that player. And I don't, I don't really get it. I don't know why they're doing that. You get it with the Zubamendi stuff, but if he's 60 million euros over the summer, it seems like Barcelona don't have 60 million. He's about to turn 24, I think, tomorrow, that being Zubamendi. So you get why Zubamendi would be the pick, but it seems like Zubamendi's already out and very much like the right-back spot or the, the full-back spots. It seems like, unfortunately, Barcelona looked at A, B, C, and these were the worries with the finances. You knew the finances would be an issue where Barcelona was going to have to settle for options D through F. And to me, Amrabat seems like option D at this point. And even him, $30 million is too much for Barca. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I honestly not very convinced uh, in terms of signing Amrabat. Um, I, of course, he had a wonderful World Cup, but there's so many players that tend to do so good in the World Cup, but then kind of lose a bit of that momentum and, and never really... Uh, shine the way that they did, you know, and I'm a bit worried that could be the case, especially if you're going to pay those 30, 40 million, etc. You know, it said that Barca asked for a loan move and uh, a possibility of buying for 40 million, but of course not being obligatory. Uh, and I can under- I can understand that Fiorentino would reject that, knowing Barca is not going through um, a good moment, and they'd probably say no to, to buying him. And that of course would be maybe uh, backlash towards them. But of course, I, I understand why why uh, Fiorentina want to ask for money because yeah, they're going to make the most of, of, of um, how he sold himself during that World Cup and, and you know, he's going to gather lots of interest. It was also uh, seeming like he might be going to Atletico Madrid. It was another team that was very close to signing Amrabat or at least uh, seemed to be interested in this transfer market, but that kind of died off a bit. And now Barca kind of came out of nowhere, which honestly, I just, as I said, I'm not too convinced. I think it would be too risky. If it's a loan move, Okay, if, there's, if there was a buyout, a obligatory buyout for, I don't know, 10 million, maybe I could even consider 15, something like that. But if you're going up to 30, that's just not going to happen. And honestly, I don't think there's going to be an agreement. Uh, Barca have left things to the very last minute, or at least that's what it seems. There hasn't been much movement where when we thought that Barca were going to be way more active, because of course, uh, we did get rid of Memphis Depay. Now we're probably going to get rid of Hector Villarín, Xavi. Um, has always shown that uh, there's been something missing in that right wing, that, of course, if a player left, that he would want a replacement. He did say that, that the club guaranteed that there would be a replacement, and apparently that's not going to be the case. And now that it seems like we have a bit of a salary space that La Liga said we didn't, but then Barca went through uh, other mediums, um, 
in terms of law and stuff to try and, and, and get that accepted. It seems like they have been allowed. And as a matter of fact, just a few minutes ago, Gabi has been officially uh, registered in La Liga. So, I mean, that's, of course, a bit of money that's going away. Uh, it's going to, to Gabi's contract, like it will probably happen to Ronald Araujos and, and other uh, possible renewals like uh, Marcos Alonso, we were saying. So, in that sense, that's a little bit of money that you have less to spend in this transfer market. So, unless there's some sort of miracle or, or incredible deal that Mateo Alemán can... Uh, kind of pull out of his hat. I, I don't really see anything happening. And, and the Amrabat deal, honestly, I'm, I'm not convinced. I think he was extremely good. If he can play at that level for Barca, great. But I just don't see, you know, especially in that position, which is also a very demanding position. Everyone seems to be wanting to find the, the new Busquets when that doesn't exist. There's no new Busquets. You know, there's another player that's going to play in that position, but Busquets is one and only. You know, he's a unique player and there's always going to be comparisons. And I feel like Amrabat, uh, knowing or at least people are saying, as you said, that he hasn't been performing as well lately for Fiorentina. If you look at his Sofa score ratings, for example, to get an idea, of course, not seeing him play, which is very different, but you do get a bit of an idea of how he's been doing, aren't very good uh, lately. And of course, I just think like he would be one of those guys that succumbs to the pressure and just doesn't uh, meet expectations. And he would probably end up going through the back door in summer if there's uh, no need to buy him after a loan, you know. So that's why I just don't love the option of Amrabat and I don't necessarily focus more on the f that right fullback position, which is, I think, way more necessary if you're selling Bayerin than signing a, a, um, a defensive midfielder because mm -hmm. for now you have uh, Busquets and you have Frankie de Jong at least and you can move some players around if necessary. So for me, that would be the, the main thing to look into or even an attacking player if you want to replace Memphis. Uh, but aside from that, honestly, I think that uh, it's not a priority at the moment to find uh, that position. I would take my time. I would love Sylvie Mendy, but of course, that seems like it's going to be very, very complicated. Mm -hmm. uh, but we have to see there are surely more options out there and, and they have to take the time to get it right because if not, uh, it's going to be tough without uh, Busquets in the future if he finally leaves. Right. Yeah, I think you you bring up Gabi as where we end the show, and we talk about the players that are kind of already around in in Luca Roman, the eighteen year old Argentine winger from Club Verdo, signed for Barca B. I think he was a quote unquote big signing, unless Araujo does arrive. And I wouldn't put the weight of the world on his shoulders. He's just kind of a not even a depth option, but we, you don't really know what you're going to get from him. Give him a few minutes. He's an inverted right winger. Uh, again, give him like a year or two to figure some things out or where he's going to fit in there. And the, yeah, the Gabi point is the issue. It seems like. You know, the there's been a lot of confusion between the Liga and between Barcelona to the point even that, of course, Barcelona had to take La Liga to court to get Gabi registered as a first team player. And for once in the last two year or two, the court did agree with Barcelona that it was indeed the case that by not registering him now, you put the club in a financial situation to be kind of ill prepared for not even ill prepared, but that the. It, I, I don't know exactly what the court ruling was, but it was something to the effect of not only through translations, but the legalese of it as well. But it was something to the effect of it was like it, it, it was pre there was preparedness for Gabi that the club prepared properly to register him. And then by not fulfilling how prepared Barcelona was, it'd be unfair to then put that those numbers in the summertime on the club when they seem to be mm -hmm. had, had all the preparation to, to, to register him now. But you mentioned, yeah, it's it's Araujo, it's Alonso. It's ball day. All these renewals that Barcelona still have to do is, I think, in the future, the considerations that I think people aren't doing that, that, that math for. Um, and again, a reminder, too, that the exit from the Champions League group stages left them with a negative balance on the salary cap uh, mm -hmm. that the Liga had already set out. Because remember, Barcelona, this was the concern that Barcelona did. When they submitted their salary cap for this season in the Liga, they had, I don't know why the Liga approved this though, but they, the Liga did approve these high markers of success that Barcelona did not reach. They said that they would get to the round of eight of the Champions League. And to mm -hmm. put that as your marker for what your revenue was going to be, that's a consideration. So again, the limit is set based on a percentage of the revenue. And if your revenue is going to be underachieving, then that means that financially you're, you're, in, a, you're in a hole, you're in a situation. Um, and so not reaching the quarterfinals is bad. Because uh, that was, again, major TV money. The Champions League money is the one that, that makes everything tick. So that means you have to reduce wages again. And then the only other way at this point that you make up for that European TV money is by reaching the Europa League final. Which, again, yeah. if you're La Liga and you see Ousmane and Dembele on a training table again, you say, well, <laughs> are you really going to beat Manchester United in the knockout round of the playoffs? Like, should Barcelona really be banking and put everything on 
not only beating them, th- that being Manchester United in the lo- in the knockout rounds, but then beating whoever it is next, Arsenal or uh, you know whoever it may be that's around them. Uh, I don't think Madrid did make it, but you get it. Like all the Dortmund, yeah, yeah. Ajax, like whoever it may be in the Europa League that you're facing. So the numbers we do know is that as of December, Barcelona were 26 million euros above their wage limit set at the start of the season, which was 656 million euros. So that 26 million, you say, well, what about PK? Well, what about Memphis? Well, those did help. Uh, those brought a number down a little bit. But again, the renewals of Gabi and Araujo and Alonso and Balde and the preparing for that is where the difference of those that, that wage is going to be set. So again, there's still so much work to do within the club itself that you can have your eyes. It's so hard to do to tell people the comma about um, about the transfer window, because you think there are problems with the club. You want to win a Champions League. You want to bring in new guys, and the new shiny face is going to help you get there because Rafinha and Ansu and Farron, like may not be doing their job. But it's mm-hmm. really hard to move players. It's really hard to also bring in players. And so it's difficult to say and kind of be content with. And that's kind of how I feel right now. I have to keep reminding myself, I'm sad about Ana Martinez or other players who aren't going to come to Barcelona. But you look at Barca, they're, as you said at the start of the show, they're five up in the Liga table with the team that they have. And yes, the Busquets thing, major question. Right back that, major question. Fullbacks, you know, we, we talk about that kind of stuff aplenty. But as far as trying to reinforce those two positions, when you look at the entire squad and the team that Xavi currently has at his disposal, they are a team that is capable, when playing well, of winning anything. They can win potentially four trophies a season. Like it's all possible. Mm -hmm. And so it's very difficult to look inward because some of that improvements, as I mentioned, when I talked about Gabi and Pedri, some of the improvements that are going to continue to take Barcelona to the next level are still in the team. Balde is only in theory going to get better. Araujo and Koundé, that's a partnership we have seen very little of. Who knows? Mm -hmm. Those are actually Barcelona's starting center backs with Christensen as the backup. I mean, again, I can't pick another trio in world football that I'd rather have and Araujo, Koundé, and Christensen. So there are a lot of good things happening in the squad itself, yeah. and now Barcelona have to worry about literally paying for who they already have, and they do have to take risks on a guy like Julian Araujo. So don't cry about the MLS. Say, hey, this is risky, but it's 6 million euros, and you take a shot on a guy who's, a, who's already played 100 games of first-team football somewhere and has in familiarity with Barcelona, and you take a chance that way. Yeah, definitely. I mean, uh, if you don't have options, you have to find solutions, and sometimes uh, solutions... Uh, that you have available aren't the ones you would like, but you know you have to go for them. You know, and of course we're we're extremely limited as we've, as we've always been saying lately. Barca uh, have to maneuver very very carefully. Uh, Tevas was saying that for next season there will be a de- um, sorry deficit of around two hundred million euros. I think it is in terms of uh, salary cap space and all that. So I mean it, it's so complicated to figure these things out. I mean they have to probably be calculating every single detail. You know uh, to make sure nothing goes wrong and even. If they think they got it right, Tebas comes and, and says that you got it wrong and complicates things even more because we have to say La Liga hasn't really made things easy at all for Barcelona. I can understand in a, in a sense that, of course, they want to, to be professional, keep it strict, don't allow clubs to you know do whatever they like, which I value and I respect. But at the same time, they have to understand that the situation is critical. It was a part, previous president, someone who handled things really badly, and that we're trying to get out of this situation. So... Be slightly flexible, but I want to, I mean, with uh, Tebas, it's, it's, yeah, it's how it is. Well, yeah, I want to mention that like two wrongs don't make a right. So it's like, I keep exactly. doing this where like Manchester United, Liverpool, Real Madrid, everybody just keeps getting after me again. TikTok, why am, why'd I even do that? But anyway, <laughs> like people are constantly getting after me about the finances of Barcelona. And I will never defend the fact that Bartomeu and Barcelona got themselves in this mess. And even going for broke by signing Lewandowski and Koundé and over the summertime making those signings that Laporta did continue to put Barcelona at risk where they had to succeed and the gamble has not paid off because they failed. And so I'm not defending Barcelona in that way. What I am defending is that Liga as a total product. They, it may not be English speaking language. It may be 30 years, but like La Liga needs to use the failures of Barcelona instead of other fans in the Liga saying, oh yeah, Barcelona deserve what they're getting. It's not just Barcelona. It's all of La Liga. Like they have to do yeah. a better job of helping their clubs find financial success and with revenue and with profit, not just by limiting them. Like they're limiting their spending so they're they don't they're not insolvent and so they do like so that they have healthy financial clubs. Yes, but you are so far behind the Liga, you have to find ways to push this forward. And is that allowing Barcelona not to, to make it a duopoly again with Real Madrid, but allowing Barcelona to spend? And by that I mean do not put an article or change in article was at 93, 93.5. Uh, the article change that they just voted on in December to limit 
the the lever pulling like the media created the idea of lever pulling <laughs> but like i i when i had my crimson yeah, yeah, yeah. talked about like future revenue and the small percentage of the next 30 years of potential revenue that Barcelona were banking on. Like the bigger risk was signing the players in the, in the summertime more than it was like pulling the levers. Like the levers don't drastically affect like the, the future earnings of Barcelona with the revenue mm -hmm. that, that you know that in a post, no, I mean in a pre COVID and potentially a post COVID world that this club can bring in, like not taking into account like, you know, acts of God and things like that. So like, I, I'm just, I'm kind of a little riled up by the fact that like La Liga would do like put that article in place because I understand the sentiment that like we can't have clubs like finding different ways of revenue and getting out of like just reducing their wage bill. Like the wage bill is the issue and continues to be the problem. But I just yeah. question why La Liga, you know, again, two wrongs don't make it right, right? Like I yeah, think La Liga yeah, yeah. is a bit tight and not understanding that you're, you are hurting your own product by not yeah, yeah, like, absolutely. giving clubs a little I'm like, yeah, like leeway, but also Barcelona, like, yeah, they got themselves in this mess. They have to reduce the wage bills. De Young makes too much. Alba makes too much. I'm not, like, I'm not defending that club in the same way. Like, but again, mm -hmm. everybody is wrong and it's frustrating. Yeah, and, and it's not just Barca that are going through through tough times in La Liga. Another example is Sevilla. And we, have, we, we can't yeah. forget that we're, we're coming from COVID, you know, and, and it's not easy for clubs to kind of uh, regain uh, that... Um, those moments they had where, of course, things were going well, the fans were going to the stadiums, everything, um, has really come back, but it's been slowly and it's really affected the clubs. And as I was saying with Sevilla, for example, they're going through a tough time. They had to sell Kunde, they had to sell Diego Carlos, their two best uh, centre-backs. And they were a team that was uh, ascending, going to a better place, supposedly. But look at, look at this season where they've had to really uh, struggle because, of course, they've been very limited economically. They had to get rid of Ocampos, who finally came back. And uh, in Sevilla, there's... Abs so much pressure and it's not just them sorry there's other clubs which are also uh, being quite limited in terms of their signings even Betis themselves had some trouble in terms of um, registering players this past summer so I mean La Liga in this sense are losing out as you said you know compared to other competitions and uh, it's something they have to look into I can understand as I said uh, that they want to be strict they want things to go properly but at the same time you need your product to develop and to improve and that only happens if you're uh, teams are competing at the highest level and, and showing that they can uh, make good squads, etc. But anyway, I mean, it is how it is. Hopefully, Barca, in the end, will find a way out. As you said, they took a gamble. At the moment, it isn't paying off, but we have to see how things uh, develop. Maybe we have a fantastic season in the end, and, you know, somebody might want uh, Marcos Alonso for 20 million euros. Who knows, you know? Anything can happen. I always say, like, football changes all the time, constantly. Yeah. New things are happening. New things are changing. When you thought this guy was going to be this... He suddenly becomes that. Just take it easy, you know, enjoy the football at the moment. What we have, we're doing well. We're, we're competing for La Liga. Uh, we don't know where Barca will be in two, three, four years. So, I mean, of course, we have to talk about these things because they're essential to the club and everything. But at the same time, sometimes we need to take it easy, enjoy, and, and we'll see how things uh, work out. Well, yeah, like I, I've said many, many times, it seems like the way that the squad is built right now, at least four or five years down the line, you would hope that they already in the squad have seven or eight of the players that are going to be yeah. Barca's best players, like, you know, in their starting 11 guaranteed mm -hmm. for the next five, six, seven years. Like Barcelona's best players in the future are already around the club. I guess, let me, that's a better way of saying that. So yeah. Roman, I took way too much of your time, but again, <laughs> we had so much work to do. It's transfer deadline day. And hey, some other new players probably already signed and we're probably already wrong. You can throw out the whole <laughs> podcast. So that's, that's how it goes, Roman. But I, I appreciate you coming on and taking on again no the problem. big challenge of de de deadline transfer day. Um, again, where can people find you? I already mentioned the Liga Lowdown, but yeah, give everybody the skibby. Yeah, as usual, uh, La Liga Lowdown is our main Twitter handle. You can also find the content uh, in our Substack. We have a Substack, which is also lllonline.substack.com. We have uh, daily content, um, articles, posts, etc. And personally, if you want to follow me, I'm also on Twitter. My Twitter handle is Aeroslave with a double E at the end. And yeah, uh, always talking about uh, especially Spanish football, La Liga, and of course, Barca in, in particular, but in general, we love to talk about all teams in, in La Liga. Yeah, unfortunately, I am putting a little bit of the onus on our listeners. I always tell them that if you don't want to be disappointed when another team in the Liga punches Barca in the mouth, maybe give a little respect <laughs> to them by understanding that they're coming in in better form than, than possible. And not everybody in the Liga is just parking the bus and waiting for Barca and Real Madrid to break through in the different ways that they do. So again, that's over at the Liga Lowdown. Down in the show notes below, uh, you can click on his name, follow him through Twitter. As I said, then we are on Twitter and Instagram as well, at the Barcelona Pod. Tic Tac, as I said, closed Facebook group, Discord. Patreon, YouTube, all that stuff. I'm likely probably going to have some kind of transfer thing related tomorrow, potentially coming out, as well as the Real Betis match review. So there's a lot going on on YouTube as well. Subscribe to the channel over there. But most importantly, thanks so much for listening to the show. Until next time, we'll talk to you soon. And for Sabarsa.